Today's book is Palace of Desire by Naguib Mahfouz. Uh, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. So this is the Cairo Trilogy Volume 2. This is the second book in the Cairo Trilogy. The first book is called Palace Walk and I reviewed that last year. Um, I'll link to my original review of Palace Walk in the description. Um, in that review, I kind of gave the background of the series and talked about how I got into it and talked about the general impressions and tone and stuff like that. Uh, and it seems a waste of time to repeat all that all over again. So I'm going to try and just kind of not repeat myself too much from everything I said in the last review of this trilogy. I'll give some very brief background, kind of try and rush through things, and then try and get into the meat of this. Uh, and because, because I won't be talking about the tone of the book so much, I'm going to get into a lot more of the plot of the second book. Uh, so in other words, there, there's going to be a lot of spoilers in this. Okay, so just quickly then, because I went through all this in the previous video, uh, the Cairo Trilogy is a series of three books, trilogy, uh, that was written in e Egypt originally and Ara Arabic uh, in the 1950s, which chronicles a middle-class Egyptian life kind of over a period of roughly 30 years from kind of World War I to just right before World War II and kind of chronicles how they change and how kind of Egyptian society is changing. These books were hugely influential in Egypt in the Arab world. They got translated into English around 1990. Uh, they're classics of a sort. They're classics in Egypt. They're, I think, well known in university literature departments. I first heard about them from the Great Courses series, The History of World Literature by Grant Vaught. He described the books and the themes, uh, and I am influenced by his analysis. Uh, so uh, not all of these ideas are my own. Some of them come kind of via Professor Grant Vaught. Okay. So this is the second book in the trilogy. This takes place kind of f five years after the previous one ended. And I get a little bit fuzzy on the details, uh, on, sorry, on the timing here. But I think this book covers a period of maybe two or three years. The, the characters seem to age to a certain degree within the book. Um, so it's kind of 1920s Egypt. Um, so I guess, right, politically. Um, one, I mentioned this in the first review. One of the reasons I was interested in picking up this trilogy is because I'm a history geek. Uh, and the trilogy kind of is historical fiction. It's about the changes in Egyptian society during a politically turbulent time. Um, so I was kind of thinking I would learn some Egyptian history from this, but I learned very little. Uh, there are all sorts of references to political events, like something like, oh, did you see in the paper, so-and-so today is back in Egypt and he's giving a speech to the king, or so-and-so just went to England to negotiate the independence, or something like that. Um, but none of it is really explained. Uh, of course, obviously, this book was originally written for an Egyptian audience. Maybe they didn't need the explanations. But there's, yeah, there's all these kind of names that are tossed out there, but you don't really learn any history. The good news, though, is you, you don't need any. Uh, like, you can understand the book fine without understanding who any of these names are, or kind of without a detailed understanding of the politics of the period. It's, it's a transition period. Egypt had been kind of ruled by Britain, they're in the process of negotiating their independence, and then there seems to be the factions in Egypt, kind of, not only are they becoming independent from Britain, but they're also negotiating kind of who is going to be in control of Egypt once Britain leaves. Um, 
this book takes place, I think, the beginning is five years after the previous one ended. Uh, and a big theme in this book is kind of the passage of time in aging, or kind of, yeah, aging, the, the toll that time takes on the human body. So the father of this family uh, was in his mid-40s, I think, at the beginning of the previous book. So he wasn't a young man, he was middle-aged, but he was, but you know, mid-40s is kind of still young. Uh, you know, you, you've still got your health and vitality and stuff like that. And he was, you know, going out every night and having affairs with women and drinking and partying with his friends. And now he's in his 50s and his age is beginning to catch up with him. Um, kind of right at the beginning, he's feeling slower. He's kind of feeling achier. He's not able to kind of, the hangovers are hitting him harder. Uh, and then by the end of the book, uh, the health problems are going to get more severe. He, he, you know, he has a stroke at one point, which he recovers from, but it's like, yikes, okay, this guy is, he's, he's not young anymore, right? He's, uh, this, all this is catching up to him. So, um, you, you get this right from the very first chapter where you get kind of the the narration takes you right into the character's head almost in a stream of consciousness type way so you get insights into kind of uh the father kind of thinking about how age is slowing him down and how his wife looks older and yeah it's it's a big theme in this book is how age is beginning to catch up to some of these characters now uh, and my understanding is that this will continue to be a theme throughout the rest of the trilogy, kind of how age destroys people, uh, age, time destroys people. At the same time, uh, there's another theme of the trilogy is kind of the changeover from generations. So as the father is kind of uh, fading out from the partying scene, his son Yassin, who is 28 now, is picking up the slack and now Yassin is the one who's out every night kind of drinking and meeting up women and kind of getting into trouble. Uh, before, in the previous book, kind of all the children in the house had been under kind of such tight control from the father that they really couldn't, they didn't have any freedom. Uh, now Yassin is, um, well he's 28, he's got his own job, he's, uh, he, he, he's gets married and he leaves the house in the middle of the book. So there's no one to control him now and he gets he's getting into all sorts of trouble um, out and about. Um, yeah, so I guess while I'm on this tangent, but why don't I talk about this? Uh, there's some interesting soap opera type stuff that's going on here because there's not one but two cases really where the father and son become entangled uh, with the same woman in this book. Um, one, one at the beginning is when the son has an affair with uh, the mother of, a, of one of the neighborhood girls. And the father is not having an affair with her simultaneously. The father had had an affair with the same woman in the previous book. But it's like, ooh, okay, this is kind of getting interesting, right? That, you know, they don't even know that they've been sleeping with the same woman. Um, but then later, uh, the father is kind of cultivating a mistress. Um, and then one of the things now that he's getting old is he's losing his touch with women. Like the women used to adore him. Now that he's getting into his mid-50s, late 50s, he's, he's having to kind of spend a lot of money to get these women to pay attention to him, which he didn't used to have to do before. So there's, it's a big blow to his ego. Um, but then uh, the woman actually, she had been with the son briefly in the previous book, although the father never knew that. But then she comes back to the son and they, they kind of are getting together. And uh, then the father is kind of lovesick, so he's following her to find out. Um, and so I'm reading all this and I th I'm thinking, okay, you know, this is a classic book. I mean, it's, it's a classic in the Arab world, it's a classic in literary circles. 
But boy, there is a lot of kind of trashy, kind of soap opera type uh, story going on here, right? Uh, intrigue and stuff like that. Um, but, it, you know, it makes it interesting. Like, it, it keeps you kind of turning the pages to kind of see what's going to happen next. So that was just kind of, I guess, my ignorant assessment of the book. I just thought that was, you know, the how in order to make his classic book interesting, Naguib Mahfouz had kind of snuck in some trashy drama into it, into a classic. But then I was reading the review of, uh, the Washington Post had done in this book, and they said, uh, it's just like the brothers Karamazov. And then I thought, oh, of course. Uh, how could I have missed that? So stupid not to pick up on that. Because, you know, I just read the brothers Karamazov last year. Should be fresh in my mind. I have no excuse for not missing it. But, yeah, I, you know, I missed it. Sometimes this stuff can be right in front of your face and you just miss it. So, right, in the Brothers Karamazov, uh, the father and the son are both kind of courting the same girl. Um, and the Washington Post said, you know, that's not an accident. That's a direct influence on this book. And I, I thought about it. I thought, yeah, they're probably right. And, in fact, the more you think about it, or the more I thought about it, the more these parallels... The, the, they seem to come in more and more, right? In the brothers Karamazov, both the father and the son are sensualists. They're, they're, they've, they've, they're, that's their defining characteristic. In this book, uh, the father, the, there's three sons in this book, just like there's three sons in the brothers Karamazov. All of them are different, just like they're all different in the brothers Karamazov. Um, but one son is a sensualist, just like in the Brothers Karamazov, one of the sons was a sensualist, and that was the son who took after the father the most, and that was the son who was competing with the father for the same girl, just like in this book. The other son was an intellectual who kind of quarreled with religion, just like in this book. Uh, and I'll get to that later, talking about the youngest son, Camille, in here. I guess in the Brothers Karamazov, the youngest son, it was the, the middle son who was kind of the intellectual and the, and the uh, atheist. Uh, in this book, it's the youngest son, so the parallels break down a little bit there. It's not an exact parallel, but um, yeah, probably not a coincidence. Huh? Probably this is very carefully modeled off some of the Brothers Karamazov. Uh, one of the things I picked up from that History of World Literature lecture series was that Naguib Mahfouz was well-versed in Western literature and he was kind of actively borrowing themes from a lot of Western writers. So, so he probably was actively modeling that on Dostoevsky. So, yeah, that was all interesting. Um, and then... The youngest son, Kamal, K-A-M-A-L, hopefully I'm pronouncing that right. Now, in the previous book, Kamal had been a little kid. And this is a nitpick, but I always kind of, I thought in the previous book, he was acting a little bit too young. Like in the previous book, he was about 10 years old, but I thought he acted like about six, like... I don't know. It, it, some of this is open to interpretation about, like, what does a real 10-year-old act like? Um, but, you know, I thought, I thought he was acting a little bit immature for his age. He was just kind of always getting into mischief, completely oblivious to anything, just act, asking all these stupid questions just like a real little kid. Um, but re I guess regardless of your interpretation about what the appropriate age was, Kamal was a little kid in the previous book and kind of just manifested all the innocence and naivete of a little kid. Now in this book, he starts out at 17, and I think as the book goes through, he goes through 18 or 19 or something like that. 
those kind of late teenage years, 17, 18, 19, where you're becoming an adult. Um, and Kamal is gone from kind of the least interesting character, kind of almost just a minor character in the previous book, to becoming one of the major characters in this book, where, uh, where his story takes up a lot of the, yeah, a lot of the space of the novel. Now, I was, I was looking around in this on Wikipedia, and I was kind of doing some math, and Naguib Mahfouz, who lived through these times, would have been about the same age as Kamal was in the 1920s, like at the time this book is set. And then again on Wikipedia, uh, I think Naguib Mahfouz admits straight out that some of his own adolescence was kind of written into the character of Kamal. I, I, I kind of suspected that anyways. Um, so Kamal has become, I guess, this intellectual character. Uh, he's becoming obsessed with philosophy. He wants to go to the teacher's college, not because he wants to become a teacher, but because he wants to be able to study philosophy. Uh, and um, yeah, I, he's, he's, very, he's very sympathetic in a way. And I guess I felt like I identified with it a, a, to a certain extent. And I think probably the kind of people who read this book are the kind of people who would tend to identify with Kamal, you know, people who like books like this and are interested in kind of the world of ideas would, would kind of identify with Kamal. If you're reading this book, you probably identify with him a little bit. Um, so he's, he's, the thing is, I, th I think Naguib Mahfouz really does a very good job of capturing what it's like to be that age. And because the narration gets into the heads of these characters so much, you kind of know everything the characters are thinking. There's kind of a stream of consciousness narration. Um, you kind of are seeing everything he's, he's thinking and kind of seeing the world through his eyes. And on the one hand, he's coming across as incredibly pretentious. He's kind of making distinctions between people like him who are intellectuals and some of his friends who are not worthy about the, the world of ideas. Uh, and he's just kind of so obsessed with himself and he's becoming so self-absorbed that he's almost, he's almost kind of on the verge of becoming dislikable or kind of unbearable as a character. But on the other hand, I, you know, I remembered what it was like to be that age where you do have kind of these big ideas and you feel like there's these there's something out there in life that's larger than yourself uh, and you don't you feel like being connected to your ideals kind of makes you part of something a lot bigger and then kind of it's an exciting it's an exciting time in your life, I guess, to kind of be influenced by all these ideas and to kind of feel, feel like you could be a part of something exciting by attaching yourself to these ideals. Um, I think you lose that as you get older. I don't know. Maybe I'm, maybe I'm making a confession here and divulging something about myself, but I think this is fairly universal. At a certain point in adulthood, life becomes less about the big ideas and it becomes more about the day-to-day -day grind. You know, you get up, you go to work, you come home, you go to sleep. You get up, you go to work, you come home, you go to sleep. Um, and I think that's true even for people who are in idealistic jobs. You know, like even if you work for the UN solving world hunger, at a certain point, it becomes less about the big idea and it becomes more about kind of the day-to-day -day kind of chipping away at the problem. Uh, you know, you're, you're still doing good and you're still helping the world, but you're, you're just kind of 
your day-to-day -day work is kind of more of a grind away at this problem instead of this excitement about new ideas. I don't know, maybe I'm not articulating this well. Uh, there's an excitement about new ideas when you're young that you lose when you get older. And I think this book did a good job of capturing it, is I guess what I want to say. Along with that, uh, Kamal is obsessed with this girl. He's really in love with this girl and he spends so much time thinking about his love for this girl. Now, there's an irony in this and it's something that the reader can see right away from the beginning, although it takes a long time to play out in the book itself. But the reader can see right away that because he's put this girl on such a pedestal, it means he'll never actually possess her in real life. Uh, he, he's made her into such an object of reverence that he can never possibly, you know, get the courage or kind of uh, make a direct move on her. It would seem almost kind of blasphemous to him to kind of a, approach her just like a normal girl. So, sure enough, she ends up with another guy. Some, somebody who's uh, a lot richer, more confident than Kamal, who is able to directly approach her, uh, which he is never able to do. So, you know, the irony is that kind of because he was so in love with her, that's the very thing that made it so that he could never possess her. Um, but, you know, that's irony, but that's also, that's real life. I mean, that was my teenage years to a T. That was like me exactly when I was that age. Uh, you, you always get this idealization of certain girls, which means that you will never be able to approach them. Uh, so it's, I mean, it's, it's what boys of that age are likely to do. Uh, uh, boys of that age of a certain temperament. Now, the thing about this whole thing with Kamal and this girl he's in love with is it's very obvious from the beginning where this is all going. And yet you still have to kind of get through the whole book. I mean, there's other stuff happening in this book as well. But a lot of it is made up of this romantic subplot. So there are sections where this kind of borders on tedious, where Kamal is just going on and on about like how he loves this girl. Um, and again, it's kind of a stream of consciousness narration, so you're just kind of thinking, seeing all his thoughts and how he's revering her. And I, I was reading a couple reviews online by people who thought that this, this was a bit much. It got a bit tedious. And I can see that, and it maybe it almost did at points. But then the other thing, and this ties into what I was saying before, um, you know, this romantic obsession that Kamal has with this girl has grown into kind of something bigger than himself. So again, it's like the idealism of being young to a certain extent. You, you have this idealistic view of love, which is something that you, you feel is real and in the universe and kind of uh, eternal or I don't know it it's something that feels bigger than yourself that you have at that age uh, and when you read kind of Kamal's obsession with this girl you kind of feel nostalgic a bit for that kind of young love um, and even when he gets his heart broken because she ends up with another guy, he just wallows in self-pity. But he's, he's almost enjoying the self-pity. And I think the narration pretty much says so explicitly. Like it, Kamal kind of, he's at the wedding where she's marrying another guy and Kamal is kind of promising himself. He's like, don't worry self. When we get home, we'll just spend all, we'll torture ourselves endlessly about this and we'll write about this in our diary. So, you know, that intense kind of hurt, um, just because you're feeling something that deeply is almost, 
Uh, he's almost enjoying the misery of it. Which again, I think is something you have at that age where, yeah, there's a certain kind of wall, of f feeling your heart broken, you, you do kind of wall in the self-pity of it a little bit and do take some enjoyment from it. Uh, it, it. Enjoyment is a bit of a perverse word, but maybe you know what I mean. So, for all those reasons, Kamal seemed like a very interesting character. Um, there, there's another factor as well, actually, which, which makes him an interesting character. Um, and that Kamal is struggling with his faith throughout this whole book. And there's, again, there's another irony here. Because Kamal is the only male in the family, the only male left, um, now that the eldest, the, the other brother has died in the previous book, the only one who takes the religion seriously. So like his father and his older brother are out drinking every night, sleeping with prostitutes, you know, completely forbidden by Islam, the drinking and the sleeping around. And Kamal does not touch alcohol at all. Like his friends are trying to get him there. Like, don't just have a ham sandwich, just drink the alcohol. He's like, nope, nope, nope. It, he takes religion so seriously, but the irony is that precisely because he takes religion so seriously, he's the one who loses his faith by the end of the book. Because his brother and his father never really think about it. You know, they go drinking out every night, and then in the morning, you know, they feel penitent and they do their prayers. And it's just something that they, they, they're just going through the motions and they're not really letting it keep them from anything they want to do. Because Kamal takes it seriously and because he kind of tries to make, he tries to have a congruence between his actions and his beliefs, as soon as he starts to kind of notice the problems in his beliefs, then he just can't keep the system going anymore. So the, the thing that kind of starts it all out is there was, there's a martyr, there's a tomb of a martyr nearby the house. Uh, and in the, pre I think his name is Hussein or something like that. And in the previous book, this had been a big plot point because Kamal and his mother had wanted to see the, the martyr's tomb. The mother was forbidden to leave the house. Kamal got his mother to kind of come out to see the, the martyr's tomb. Um, it was this big plot point in the, in the previous book. Now in this book, Kamal is kind of in university and he finds out from his teachers that actually the, the martyr's not really buried in that tomb. It's just kind of an urban legend. The martyr is buried somewhere else in Arabia. And it just devastates him. Because, uh, I mean, he's, he was so obsessed with this romantic image of having the martyr next door where it doesn't really bother his father or his brother. They're just like, oh, whatever. Uh, it doesn't bother his friend so much. Um, and then, later in the book, kind of near the end, Kamal publishes an article on Darwin in one of the journals and he publishes it he doesn't want his family to find out about it but his father's friends bring him the article and they said oh look congratulations your son is getting published he's going to be famous one day and the father is proud that his son gets published but then his father is looking through it uh, and then his father uh, realizes what the article is about and confronts his son um, I'm out of time. There's a lot more interesting stuff in this book, but I'm going to have to stop it here.